So, um, hello everyone, welcome to the today's session. I will share my presentation now. Just give me a sec. Okay. So, um, hello everyone, welcome to the session, uh, to the series of a webinar titled International Training Program on Medical Training and Education in Digital Era, Perspective and Challenges. The project is in the frame of the European Project Child of Central Asia. My name is Sandra Kucina and I'm Eden President and I'm going to be the moderator of today's session. Um, the project itself, uh, Child CA project, uh, as you can see, is to support modernization and internalization uh, in the postgraduate training in universities of Central Asia in the fields of pediatrics, pediatric surgery, and child neuropsychiatry. Uh, more about the project you will hear from today's speakers. Uh, just let me briefly uh, tell you a few words about the Eden. I'm very happy that uh, we are celebrating uh, three decades of serving modernization in education in Europe this year, and that uh, we are uh, co-organizing this uh, series of webinar together with uh, the project Child Central Asia because our aim is to share knowledge and improve understanding amongst professional in distance any learning across the whole of Europe and beyond. And still we have uh, time, if you, if you are open for that, to uh, participate at the Eden Conference, uh, which is uh, going to be in the June this year, uh, virtually in Madrid. So if you look at our web pages, uh, you will find all necessary information. So let's go back to the session today. The title of first webinar is Developing Teaching and Learning Opportunities and Facilities in, child and, in Children Care. And uh, the goal of this present webinar today is to introduce a course based of five, on five me meetings, uh, this one including with aim to help uh, participating high education institutions in the Central Asia to build interconnected multi-directional environment uh, to promote interaction between teachers and students, uh, also from distant resources, and to help update some uh, educational methodologies. Uh, so more about that you will hear today from our speakers. And I'm very happy uh, to announce today's speakers. Uh, first, we have Gian Battista Parigi, pediatric surgeon from Department of Clinical and Surgical Sciences, president uh, of Committee for International Cooperation at University of Pavia. Then we have Jacek Urbaniek, head of the e-learning center of Jagiellonian University, co-founder of the Association for Academic e-learning in Poland. Tomaso Minerva from the Department of Surgery, De Medicine and Dentistry, coordinator and director of EduNova uh, from University of Modena, uh, uh, Reggio Emilia, president of Edu Open and of Italian e-learning society. Stefano Govoni, professor emeritus of pharmacology, former rector's delegate for teaching and learning activities from University of Pavia. And my dear colleague, Elena Calderola from University Pavia e-learning center. She is directing there and she is also Eden executive, executive committee member. So with this short introduction, I want to give the floor to my speakers to give you more details about this project and aim of this series of webinars. So I'll stop sharing my slides and uh, I'm giving the word to Gian Battista to give a brief brief introduction about the project and to give the opening of the session. So, Gian Battista, please. Thank you very much, Sandra. I will share also my screen. Therefore, well, first of all, uh, uh, good morning to everybody. I'm very glad to see uh, so many people joining us in this, uh, let's say, adventure, who started, uh, which started some years ago. Actually, it started 
in an international conference in Tashkent in 2015 about uh, pediatrics. And during the conference, this uh, slide was presented dealing with the infant mortality in the various, in the three specific countries involved in the project, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, versus uh, the same mortality in Poland, Germany, and uh, Italy. Two per thousand in our countries, six per thousand in Kazakhstan, 17 and 20 per thousand. Therefore, wide space for improvement. While discussing during this meeting, we realized that one possible cause could be the fact that postgraduate medical training in Europe, according to European curricula, is five to six years, while in Central Asia curricula is two to three years. Therefore, we said together, why can't we build up a capacity building in higher education Erasmus Plus project to this aim? Formally, technically, I quote, to support the modernization, professionalization, and internationalization of postgraduate training in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, higher education institution in the fields of pediatrics, pediatric surgery, and child neuropsychiatry. We presented the project to the European Commission, and actually it was approved uh, for a three years period that luckily has been postponed to four years because of the pandemics. It was funded with a short, a bit short than 1 million euro with these three uh, countries and uh, with uh, these partners, uh, the European Pavia, Jagellonian and Ulm now uh, Freiburg, eight uh, partners in uh, three in Kazakhstan, three in Tajikistan and two in Uzbekistan. You can see the different universities and uh, a good deal of uh, associated partners. Among them, uh, Eden, the ministries of higher education and science of Kazakhstan and uh, Uzbekistan. Now we are dealing to join also the ministry of uh, Tajikistan. All the project was organized in made in working packages. Uh, these are who's who within uh, the different working packages among the different universities. As uh, Sandra kindly said, you can find all the details, all the working packages into our website. The two most important for today's and this course meeting are <clears throat> the working package four, that is the training of academic staff involved in the new integrated curricula in pediatric care, specifically speaking about uh, how to arrange uh, the new ways apart from what is uh, the uh, pandemic, but which are the new ways we have to utilize ICT, IC technology to change the way by which we are giving our lectures. More, still more specifically, the working package six, uh, that is in charge at uh, Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, is this one. Specifically, introduction of ICT technologies as a tool for interactive education, e-learning, and continuing education. We already equipped one ICT classroom in all of the involved universities. Uh, apart from Uzbekistan, still some problems over there. We are going on training the technical staff in this management, but now we have to start training the teachers, teaching the teachers in how to use these new ICT tools and uh, possibly also to prepare a guideline document within these activities. Therefore, the scope, the final goal of these webinars are exactly dealing with this kind of uh, problem. What I want to emphasize as a last message is that uh, all people uh, that will follow fully the webinars uh, will be awarded uh, an open badge. For those of you not uh, deep into this uh, system, uh, open badge is a digital certificate of disciplinary knowledge dealing with the soft skills that someone has acquired. There are some technical specification. What is important that the open badge that will be awarded will be 
issued jointly by Eden and our universities, and this open badge, it is internationally recognized and therefore will be able to leave to our attendees this kind of certification, <clears throat> just testifying their involvement in this kind of activity that will be absolutely important for not only our partners, but also for all the other people wishing to follow the things. This morning, actually, before this meeting, I had a meeting with eight universities in the field of genetics and having the possibility of utilizing all the ICT technology for interactive teaching among six different countries, it is absolutely fundamental and is the future of the medical teaching. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for the introduction to, to, the, to the session uh, about the project. Just to one question, it is my curiosity, is because you have started in 2019 when we had, let's say, normal time. Um, now, do you think that you had to uh, make some change in regarding the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, and the use uh, of digital technologies uh, uh, in the project, did you have to modify some working packages because of that? Actually, I must say we were <laughs> forecasting the future because having uh, some teachers in Europe, uh, Italy, Poland, Germany, the students uh, in Central Asia, we had to go on with this kind of uh, teaching, uh, online teaching, well before the pandemics. The pandemics somewhat forced us. And if I can say so, it helped the fact before the pandemics, having a meeting via Zoom, etc. What's so what? Oh my God, what's that, etc. Now, each one of us knows very well what is a Zoom or a go to meeting or a team or a whatsoever. I reached my record one day with seven different meetings in the same day. And therefore, I can say that the pandemic somewhat facilitated this kind of approach because now each one knows exactly what does it mean to have a lecture given online and so on. And therefore, we hadn't to change much. I would say we were forecasting what happened actually this is the yeah this is good. what came so something good comes out of pandemic actually <laughs> something well don't put the balance in between <laughs> yes. what is worse and what is good but something good uh, just to to give a a, a bit of a curiosity yeah it was <clears throat> when i sneeze yes when i sneeze yeah what you tell me well, maybe you have the... the, the after, after, after sneezing, yeah. we say, bless you. Bless you. Yeah. Bless or you. in Italian, salute, or salud, or whatsoever. Why should you wish me else while sneezing? It seems crazy. This is a, a custom that was introduced 1348 during the Black Plague. In the Black Plague 1348, Sneezing was either a trivial physiological act or the sign, sorry, guy, you have four days and in four days you'll be died. You'll be died. Therefore, now, today, after six and a half centuries, we are still having the effects of a pandemic seven centuries old. Yes. This pandemic will leave his... Uh, uh, forecast is uh, passing, etc., etc., for the next uh, don't know centuries, but for sure many, many decades or years, and therefore this will be another something that the pandemic put into our lives, into our way of uh, being teachers, etc., etc., etc. Good, thank you, thank you. Interesting. I have learned something now. 
Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions for the speakers, you can put them in the question and answer uh, part. We will uh, answer the questions as we are going uh, through the through the session. Uh, you can also uh, put them into the chat, but if it's better, it's better if you are putting them into question and uh, answer. So uh, let me now announce the second uh, speaker. Uh, Jacek Urbaniek, who will give us uh, uh, some introduction into the to topic of e-learning role and perspectives in higher education institution. So Jacek, please, floor is yours. Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, good uh, afternoon to everybody, because as far as I know, just now is, it is 3 p.m. in Central Asia. Yes, so good afternoon. And I would like to ask you to remember about the date, the 27th of May, yes? Uh, and the time is the same, 9 uh, a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, so 3 uh, p.m. Uh, uh, in your countries, yes? And I can assure you that uh, the next webinar will be both interesting and fruitful, yes? That's a kind of joke, but not only a joke. And the uh, topic, uh, the main theme of this uh, next webinar is medical faculties and digital education, yes? So uh, this tension because uh, uh, between digital education and medical faculties, yes? And uh, the first speaker will be uh, the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. Yes, uh, that's uh, Przemko Kwinta. Yeah? Uh, why? I will try to explain why I decided to ask him. Because generally, not only at pedagogical uh, faculties, uh, the system of learning and teaching is lecture-centered education. Uh, but on the other hand, we in Poland, but I guess also in your countries, uh, have some problems with the attendance of students uh, at uh, lectures. There is really a kind of a crisis of uh, lecturing in a traditional form. I mean, uh, in a, a lecture hall, uh, stationary, etc. And just now, uh, there is a tendency, it started in the States, to change the whole system of education at uh, uh, medical faculties. So, <laughs> no more lecture-centered education. Uh, and everything is... Uh, around based on lectures. Why? For example, Przemko Quinta and the main dean complained to me that students, uh, even if they attend lectures and then go to uh, the hospital, uh, you know, for uh, clinical classes, <laughs> they forgot everything. And, uh, you know, uh, doctors must start uh, once more and say once more all this theoretical issue. And it was uh, actually really uh, quite a large project at the Faculty of uh, uh, Medicine at my university, uh, Krakow University, you know, to switch from traditional lecturing into you know, uh, courses uh, on the e-learning platform. Uh, can you imagine that it was almost in two uh, uh, years, almost 60 courses, yes? So uh, these modules of particular courses, altogether it is 360, something like that. And it was, uh, you know, all professors had to learn all uh, techniques uh, needed to do so, etc. And it was actually done just before the pandemic. So the whole, uh, you know, project 
ended just before the pandemic. And uh, all uh, lectures were on the e-learning platform. So that's interesting, I guess, for you, <laughs> the, the whole uh, process. Uh, it is not easy, actually, how to organize such a shift from traditional into digital lecturing. Moreover, still, uh, uh, lectures were on the learning platform uh, at the Faculty of Medicine at uh, the Jagiellonian University. But the pandemic, it was a, ter a terrible, you know, uh, event. And all other uh, activities had to, to be, uh, you know, moved into uh, the virtual sphere, yes? Uh, so just we see, you know, how it works, yes? Uh, generally, the main tendency, not only at the medical faculty, uh, but also at different faculties, at my university, but also at other uh, European universities, you know, it was the tendency to use synchronic, uh, synchronous activities, yes? Like using... MS Teams, Zoom, we are just now using uh, the Zoom software, uh, WebEx, uh, Big Blue Button, etc. Uh, and uh, also it was uh, done in such a way at the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, but there were bad sides of this uh, attitude. And perhaps uh, uh, Professor Przemko Quinta uh, will, uh, you know, point it out uh, some, you know, disadvantages of these synchronous activities. So that's the first uh, topic during uh, the uh, webinar uh, number two. Yes. Uh, uh, then the next uh, speaker will be. Uh, Dr. Uh, Johannes Miller uh, from the University of Köln. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, Cologne University is much involved in uh, education, joint education with different universities. So it is not an easy process, especially as far as curricula you know, programs of uh, studies, syllabuses, etc. All, all that, uh, you know, staff is concerned. Uh, uh, and actually, you know, uh, I think it would be useful for all of us, including me, uh, to know how it is done at uh, Cologne University in Germany, especially that uh, they have also experience with with such uh, uh, you know activity uh, with one of the faculty of medicine in Cameroon in Africa. Yes, so I ask Johannes to you know focus more on this particular issue. Uh, uh, so that's the second speaker during uh, uh, webinar number two. The main problem, as uh, I'm sorry, oh. the main problem, as we see, is, you know, the dilemma uh, whether uh, to choose synchronous activities or asynchronous activities. So before the pandemic, generally, uh, the uh, you know, uh, asynchronous activities. Uh, were uh, dominant because uh, e learning platforms were dominant. Yes. Uh, but uh, after uh, the pandemic or during the pandemic, synchronous activities uh, just now overwhelmed, uh, you know, the vast majority of education. So generally meetings, uh, with students. So uh, uh, a professor is sitting, uh, sharing a screen, presenting uh, a PDF presentation. Uh, students are sitting or not uh, without uh, cameras and microphones. In other way, cameras and micro microphones are switched off. And uh, <laughs> a professor is talking to a black hole 
actually. Quite often, there is difficult to, to get an answer, yes? Uh, any response, any interactivity from students who formally are present in this asynchronous uh, activity. I had uh, classes with, uh, uh, you know, PhD students quite recently, and I also experienced this talking to the black hole. And uh, uh, I participated in the last, uh, the so-called President's Forum of the uh, International Council for Open and Distance Education. And uh, there were complaints that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it is too much synchronous activities uh, and not asynchronous activities. And I remember the rector, uh, vice rector actually of the university in Azerbaijan, in Baku said that uh, online learning, uh, it is not mimicking uh, traditional uh, learning, traditional teaching, yes? And very often using synchronous activities, we simply, you know, uh, mimic, you know, uh, traditional uh, uh, education. Uh, so the third topic will be how to make both synchronous and asynchronous activities interactive. How to, you know, involve students uh, for uh, action during these uh, classes. Uh, and it uh, this will be done by my colleagues, uh, 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 Wojtek Pudło and uh, uh, Andrzej Filip. And actually, we trained the teachers at my university uh, how to make, you know, uh, synchronous uh, classes uh, interactive. And it is uh, enormous uh, interest among teachers because everybody discovers the same problem. How to, uh, you know, facilitate interactivity during classes. Yeah? And uh, last but not least, because this is my topic, you know, it will be about the uh, e-assessment, yes, and uh, actually we uh, organized a webinar on e-assessment uh, within the uh, Coimbra Group Universities, and uh, actually I was one of the organizers, so I will try to uh, uh, sum up uh, all these uh, conclusions uh, of the webinar, but also just now and later on, on the 27th of May, I will show some hard statistical data. For example, uh, just now I have only one uh, slide with data. At the top, we have, you know, the grades, the results of online uh, test examinations during the summer session. So this is June and July uh, last year at my university. And the numbers are, uh, you know, <coughs> sorry, are large. So more than 3000 uh, students, uh, you know, uh, passed the exam, uh, monitored uh, online test examinations. Uh, so, uh, uh, teachers, uh, professors, examiners could observe students via uh, software like Zoom, yes, or uh, MS Teams or WebEx, uh, Big Blue Button, etc. And I was surprised, but the results of uh, uh, the, those exams were similar. So, uh, despite uh, uh, the uh, way of uh, the examination, so both uh, monitored uh, test examinations and non-monitored, the results were the same at the top. You see uh, the diagrams, yes? But at the bottom, that's uh, next uh, uh, examination uh, session. So that's winter session, uh, uh, mm, January and February, and just now much better uh, you know, results are uh, for uh, those uh, non-monitored examination. So uh, 
it can suggest that after half a year, students learn how to cheat. <laughs> you know, that's a joke, but only to some extent. And this will be the fourth, fourth and the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of the presentation during the next webinar. And then I really count on a discussion, both in written form or orally, if it is possible. And also we can answer uh, questions in Russian. I will try to, to, to do that, yes? So, spasiba wam, što wy słyszali mienia. Yes? I, okay, bye bye. Thank you, Jacek. Can you just please, the last slide, put on this as, uh, as a presenting slide, because now uh, the numbers are small and participants cannot see them. So, uh, yeah, you okay. mode, if you can do it, uh, just so that people can see the, the, the last slide with numbers. Um, okay, perhaps, uh, yes, or I can, okay, uh, well, it may uh, not... Uh, it's too small, yes? For, for mm -hmm. Yes, the, the presentation should be in the uh, presentation mode, so it's it's on a like, screen. Yeah, somehow. I know that. No. I, I didn't do, do that. Yes, uh, okay. It's time. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I see I have some troubles just now, so I will send uh, the link uh, to the, uh, the data, yes? yes I you suppose... See? You yeah, will yeah. Uh, you will have uh, all the uh, presentations available at the project web, uh, I suppose, uh, yeah. as well as the recording of, of the session. Uh, so maybe participants can find that yeah. uh, later there. The, the main idea session. is that the results of uh, monitor online test examinations were much uh, uh, were worse than not monitor during the last session. Yeah, and yeah. this is uh, important, uh, uh, you know, from the point of view of sociologists. So there's uh, essential difference. Yes, and uh, uh, people, uh, how about the numbers? So uh, more than four hundred, actually four hundred six, four thousand six hundred students, you know. Uh, uh, passed the, these uh, monitored examinations and almost 24,000 students non-monitored examinations. So uh, the, uh, the probe, uh, the sample is quite, uh, you know, significant, yes? Uh, and the results are, you know, uh, reliable, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. We can open here the, the big uh, discussion uh, related to the how students uh, felt uh, on the education suddenly fully online, how teacher felt. Uh, do we need uh, monitored exams or should we move to the formative assessment and in that way skip the possibility of monitoring and exams? So this is a very, very huge topic, but we have to go on. And our next presenter is Stefano Govoni, who is going to talk. No, sorry, Tommaso is the first. I'm sorry. Tommaso is the first. He is going to talk about continuing education in practice as a tool to keep update health professionals. So, Tommaso, do you have a presentation or you just will? Yes, I have a presentation and I'm starting to share okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Do you see my presentation? Yes, it's good. Fine, thanks. Okay, first of all, I I would like to thank uh, Sandra and Elena for the invitation to participate in this webinar cycle. Also, uh, if I'm I'm not involved in the Child CA project, but in this uh, short presentation, I will outline the topics we will addressing in the webinar scheduled on uh, July twenty second at uh, this. Uh, in same time at 11 a.m. Central European time or 9 a.m. UTC, Universal Time of Greenwich. So the topic of uh, uh, today's presentation is related to continuing education, uh, to continuing medical, to continuing education in, in, in a medical environment as a tool to, to update healthcare professionals and 
This topic uh, will be discussed in the July 22nd webinar, also together with uh, digital tools and uh, methodologies for, uh, for training. Uh, but let me summarize uh, a bit the training process of an healthcare professional. Uh, the training process of, of a healthcare professional a doctor, a nurse, a technician, includes the first phase of uh, institutional training, earning a degree, an MD, a PhD, a specialization, and so on, before starting working, before starting the profession. But the continuous evolution of medical knowledge and practices involves uh, a process of constant updating and also realignment of knowledge and skills. This continuous updating process uh, follows two parallel but closely interconnected paths, the daily professional practice and continuous education, your continuing education. The goal is twofold, to update skills and knowledge and to acquire new skills and knowledge. But uh, a process uh, of, of updating and continuing education cannot be an impromptu process. It uh, um, must be uh, guided by expert instructional designer with specific skills and uh, for training in the, medical, uh, in the medical field. And at the present, and even more so in the future, with solid skills in digital education, in its methods, and in its tools. These will be the topics uh, discussed and deepened in the webinar on July 22nd, introducing four case studies. The four case studies are uh, four different approaches and they can be, uh, can be used as uh, a four different framework in four different cases. The first is the, the labor project. Uh, it's an open education project in medicine. The second is the GIC project. It's a project of instant online education for the management of emergency, and in particular for the management of crisis in the case of the COVID pandemic. Then a master in medical humanities for the training of new professionals. And finally, the degree course in digital education that builds training experts in the context of healthcare. Few words on, on, on each of them. Uh, the labor project is a project issued by the Emilia Romagna region that offers open and free courses to both professionals and citizens. Certified courses are offered to professionals with uh, the release of an open badge at the end of the course, as Jean-Baptiste said before, while general courses are, uh, to promote health literacy are offered to citizens. So it's, uh, it's really open to, to both communities, professionals and citizens. The, the, the G course instead is a, a very interesting experience. It is a, a, it was an urgent need imposed by the COVID pandemic. During the, the, the decade phases of the pandemic spread, there was a great shortage of professionals able to operate in intensive care units and departments. The, the Jack pathway built as, as an instant education has prepared doctors specialized in not intensive care, so, such as general pediatrics, dermatologists, ophthalmologists, and so on, to operate in intensive care to support specialized teams. So in, in this way, we, we are able to increase the number of people involved in the intensive care and also to, to give some breath to the people in the, in the first line of the pandemic. 
It was a joint project of the four universities of Emilia Romagna, the University of Modena Reggio Emilia, the Alma Mater University of Bologna, the University of Parma, and the University of Ferrara too. Then the, the third case uh, involving the, um, to build new professionals is the Master in uh, Medical Humanities. It's a cross between medical sciences and humanities. The underlying principle of this master is that clinical practice must consider the human aspects of relationships, communication, narration, ethics, and also cultures. The goal of the master's program is precisely to integrate medical and clinical skills with the humanities. So it's a it's a way to, to build a new kind of um, professional in, uh, in, uh, in the medical field. And finally, the degree program in digital education is uh, an undergraduate degree program, has the goal to set educational experts with the specific skills in the education of healthcare professional. As Iacic uh, uh, suggested before, mm, they will be specialized people with skills to design and lead paths of continuous updating of knowledge and skills in, in, uh, in the medical field, but with a strong background in digital education, in digital methodologies, in digital tools, and, and so on. So, I'm at the end of my, of my very brief presentation, I will give an appointment on July 20, 22nd at, uh, at 11 a.m. To, to explore together these four topics. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Tommaso. Very important topic because definitely uh, medical uh, uh people uh, whether they are professionals or teachers uh definitely need uh upskilling and reskilling in 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 especially in the education part uh as the classroom today is not the only option uh for teaching and learning and uh, as i also have a daughter who is uh, studying uh, uh, medicine um, she has been doing everything online since the beginning of this academic year and i told her just recently that i hope she will not finish the medicine by being only online student that she will have eventually some practice before uh, become the medicine uh, <laughs> the doctor because <laughs> but uh, well uh, now the situation in croatia is improving and she has started to have the practical part uh, but uh, the ways of uh, presenting the, the 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 courses and the topics has definitely changed uh, changed with this uh, pandemic, but uh, maybe they can take this pandemic as a kind of opportunity uh, to see how we can uh, enhance and improve uh, the quality of uh, education as as such. So uh, well, I think everyone has uh, noted uh, the the date for the next webinar and is very much looking for for the session. And the next topic now we are going to have presented. Uh, this is what I have already started uh, describing uh, is updating teachers and learners to innovative interaction. I think it's very important uh, issue. And Stefano, please, floor is yours. Let us know what are the plans within the project. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. I'm really happy to be here and good afternoon to everybody in uh, Asia and good morning to the other people in the other parts of uh, our world. Uh, I think that the presentation now is on uh, as a full screen and uh, uh, my uh, title today is updating teacher and learners uh, to innovative uh, interactions. And uh, the context, uh, uh, as uh, anticipated also by the other speakers, is that uh, today we are uh, providing a kind of general reference frame for what will be uh, in-depth webinars. And uh, mm, 
I uh, took a, an approach a little bit different from the uh, previous speaker. So I have not described in detail what I will uh, coordinate on uh, July the 1st. However, uh, just while we were speaking, I added this slide uh, to uh, describe it, otherwise that was something of lacking. The intention for July 1st is uh, to show that uh, from my side, to provide details on how to train the teacher and the Pavia experience. And uh, the other uh, goal is to show that uh, uh, a distance teaching can go beyond just the teaching uh, uh, with a formal lesson, but can also transfer experience. And for that, I ask it to Maria Grazia Cusella, uh, who introduced and is following uh, the uh, anatomy age table here. How through the anatomy age you can exercise, do anatomic exercise on a virtual platform. I uh, ask it to Professor Bastianelli from Pisa to show how uh, a distance demonstrations can be useful in surgical disciplines. And Stefano Perlini, again, from Pavia, uh, what can be a clinical simulation on a, on a dame? Uh, so these are kind of practical experience that can be transferred also at distance. And that will be the topic, uh, exactly the topic of the July 1st. But let me uh, comment uh, on the uh, topic I had to deal with today uh, and why teacher updating is needed. Obviously, there are some technological aspects as also Urban already anticipated and uh, uh, here are depicted by using this image of a robot offering a coffee. Uh, there are applications, Kahoot, Mentimeter, Answer Garden, and all the uh, platform to communicate, Zoom, Google Meet, We Meet, uh, and, and so on. There are smart boards uh, that Elin introduced here in, uh, in Pavia. Uh, they are not really so uh, immediate to you. So teachers need some technical updating, but what I do think is more important is the appropriate pedagogy and content organization. Because uh, a distance teaching is not just recording a classroom teaching and then broadcasting or putting it on a repository. Uh, it needs different tools and it needs a different pedagogy. And this is the updating needed by the teachers. It is also a change of mind uh, from the ipsa dixit, uh, which is the old fashioned way of thinking of academic teaching. Uh, I said this, so you have not to discuss, just take it. Uh, and in addition, no need to improve teaching abilities, no need to learn how to teach, uh, no need to include teaching abilities among the personal goals for academic career. Uh, this is really old fashioned. And today, the development of the teaching abilities through systemic targeted action, teaching learning centers, faculty development programs are actively uh, organized by uh, several uh, universities in the world. And students also have uh, 
a central role in this process, is a transition from ex cathedra teacher centered learning to a student centered learning, and the teacher becomes a leader, should lead and orientate a group. And this needs skills that should be developed, are not really yet acquired by all the teachers. And uh, if possible, uh, also some adaptation of the learning spaces that will uh, have a better interaction between the teacher and the students, being all together, instead one against the others. Students also should be trained to a proactive relation with, with the teacher. At least this is in, in Italy, it's not easy uh, to raise questions from the students. So you need to uh, really to stimulate them repeatedly in order to get questions. Uh, What can we do? But at the beginning, uh, explore your possibilities, looking at what are the uh, local uh, facilities in your university and define your need, uh, both as a teacher and as a student. So maps of the learning needs and of the perception of didactic innovation can be uh, collected and uh, in the university through, for example, questionnaires. So there are validated questionnaires for this. Uh, mapping and promoting the didactic experimentations is also uh, um, important. Who is already doing experimentation? And if not, how, as a university governance, we can promote the experimentation uh, practices, or as in a European program like the one headed by Jean Battista? Money and human resources. Obviously, uh, you need some money, but uh, you need a proper planning because uh, without proper planning, the technology adoption can be expensive. With proper planning, you can program in time the development of your own university. On the other side, not implementing technology today, it will cost more. And this will be human costs because teachers and students will be left behind and no country can afford this. I also introduced the pandemics as uh, the, the previous uh, speakers. Uh, uh, this has been a really dramatic uh, event, but it's there, uh, we cannot go back. Uh, so the point is, what can we learn from this experience? And uh, I think that this global crisis uh, has been an extraordinary time for uh, learning how resilient we are uh, as educational systems, as teachers, as students, as families. Not all of us, but in general, the society had a rather uh, uh, human good response, we were able to react. In the field of education, what did we learn? Two main points. First, pedagogical adaptation are pivotal because you should change from traditional lecturing in person models that do not fit this uh, situation. Second, uh, 
pandemic has recalibrated the times of uh, many human activities, but within the teaching activity, it has recalibrated the time between teaching, engaging the students, and administrative tasks. The pandemic has highlighted the need for flexibility and underscored has led to the concept that the youth sh should spend more time for student-teacher interactions. And for people interested, uh, this is the reference was published uh, in February 18 this year, so it can be found easily. This is my last slide, and uh, it's a famous uh, sentence from a pedagogue saying, uh, whoever teaches learns in the act of teaching, and whoever learns teaches in the act of learning. So this is pushing us to uh, strongly reinforce and promote the relationship between teachers and learners. And I think that this is one of the lessons that is, can be applied not only on at the distance teaching, but also in blended teaching, and in presence teaching. So it's something, a change of mind that we should apply to our teaching. And this has to be uh, within the programs of updating teaching activities. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Very good points. Yes, uh, we need to move from teacher-centered to the student-centered. Uh, this is what we already started with Bologna process uh, many years ago, but somehow uh, didn't find it, uh, I would say, too much pressing to, to move, to make this shift. Finally, we had to we are now forced uh, forced to do it. And in this process, definitely uh, the pedagogical part, the methodology is very important to find the new ways, the different ways, how to approach students, how to engage them to make them active and motivated uh, participant. So we are very much uh, looking forward to the sessions uh, session you will lead in, in July. And for the last speaker, we now come to the Elena, who will talk about virtual mobility, fostering and strengthening the international cooperation and mobility. And after that, we will start uh, with discussion. So Elena, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Thank you very much for your coming, for your chairing, for organizing this webinar. And thank you very much for to Gian Battista for uh, having uh, involved me in, uh, in this <laughs> uh, so precious uh, international activities and so precious project uh, devolved to Central Asia uh, people and friends. And uh, I am uh, here just to present you uh, another uh, point of view, another topic that in my mind is uh, so relevant and so important jointly with the other points of, of view just uh, discussed from my uh, colleagues. And uh, so I want to share my presentation here. Okay. So I will um, uh, talk uh, about uh, a topic maybe can be considered a bit different and a uh, bit uh, far from uh, interest, uh, from uh, so close interest regarding uh, uh, ICT and education. Virtual mobility, why virtual mobility? Um, here, the first title was to foster and strengthening international cooperation and mobility. So the idea is, uh, from the previous presentation was to go in depth with the skill or a skill, education, ICT. Now we are just about to shift the interest and the focus or on another topic. Why? I have just retried this slide 
2011, uh, done together with my friend uh, Jacek uh, Urbaniek in Krakow Jagiellonian University, here present as a speaker in, in this uh, event. And uh, for the first time in Krakow, we talk about vitro mobility support and development uh, in the field of TICAMP project together with uh, uh, Irina Volunjevicene. And the idea was to analyze this problem, why? Because the Bologna process, uh, a very, very important and a pivotal and paramount process uh, in Europe regarding education, higher education, institutional education, said that the mobility of staff, students, and graduates is one of the core elements. And this core element is creating opportunities for personal growth, developing international cooperation between individual and institution, and enhancing the quality of higher education and research, and giving substance to the European dimension. So the idea is that education is not at all a process of isolation inside uh, each of state of Europe, but education just is something like joining state, joining education, meet people. And how can we work in order to meet people? In 2007, we talk about mobility of staff mobility of staff. And in the left of the slide, you see the higher education priorities. So uh, education has for sure a social dimension. Uh, there is um, something about lifelong, lifelong learning and Tommaso talk about this topic. For sure, the employability, student-centered learning, what Stefano in uh, his pre presentation talked about as one of, of a very important focus, a very important goal of education, research and innovation, international openness, data collection, mobility, multidimensional transparency tools, and others. So this is the general frame of why to foster mobility. But the idea and the wishes in 2009 of a European Bologna process was that in, two, in 2020, at least 20% 20 of those graduating in the European higher education area should have, have had a study or training period abroad. Unfortunately, it is really so difficult to reach this goal to increase mobility for a lot of reason. Um, first of all, for um, problem in funding, and uh, first of all, because uh, not all the students want to undertake such kind of um, experience due to a, a series of uh, motivation, a series of reason. So it is very, very difficult to increase mobility, physical mobility between uh, universities. And this was the general picture in 2009. But now we are in 2021 uh, and we are living with coronavirus effects. So we are facing unprecedented obstacles and these unprecedented obstacles have to be faced with <clears throat> process of creativity and innovation. So there is a new idea and we changed a bit our mind when we think about mobility. So, uh, reading a very interesting document from the University of Bologna, I uh, read these sentences really very, very interesting because mobility will have to be adapted and reorganized to meet the needs of a future that we have discovered to be uncertain under the coronavirus effect. For example, transforming mobility into connectivity. I think this is a very precious uh, concept, a very precious, insightful vision for us. 
Because if you think about that, mobility is something like I would like to eat, like, like this kind of joke. Mobility, you should think about mobility like something about machinery. Uh, I come from one point to another point and I come back. Another people from one point to another point and then come back. Like just a movement from machinery matters. But here we have to think about under coronavirus effect and, and under a, an uncertain future to join us like uh, organic tissue. And like an organic tissue, we have to think about to be connected, like just connectivity. This is a sentence uh, by UNA declaration, a very interesting um, new initiatives from a European Commission, that is the University Alliance from European Universities. And the European University are transnational alliances that will become the universities of the universities of the future, promoting European values and identity and revolutionizing the quality and competitiveness of European higher education. So we are creating as Europe an interesting like just an organic tissue in order to join European universities with this kind of alliances. And if you think of that, uh, what concerning mobility and joining people and meet people and to create a transnational culture um, becomes the more and more and more an important concept. These are the framework, uh, how it changed with the coronavirus. So while the mobility of the past was to move people in a certain percentage with physical mobi mobility and maybe a bit score, a, a bit percentage of people with um, virtual mobility, now we can add some more important concept, the mobility of the future. It has to be sustainable, inclusive, and virtual. Sustainable, because we learned a lesson, as Stefano said, from the pandemic uh, fact. And we learned uh, some lesson from the fact that uh, coronavirus is only the first enemy, but we have a so powerful enemies that is uh, the climate change. So we have to think about sustainable, new model, sustainable model of life. And like uh, the Pope Francesco also says, we will save if we will, will be able to save all together with an inclusive society. So for this reason, using the technologies in a sharp way, that is in this fact to use the virtual mode in order to meet people and be able to build intercultural um, uh, new way of work together will be really the model of the future. Which will be the possible models to do that? And here we are again in a sort of theoretical models. We could, we able, to create full virtual mobility experience. That is the first in which we move student in a sustainable way, in a, an inclusive way, using the advanced tools that technology is offering us. Or as a second mobile model, we could create models in which we can create joint teaching units that co-create together courses or, or action plans or, or uh, action to educate online, joint programs from different universities, like, for example, the university alliances in Europe. Or as a third model, we could create blended intensive program in which we will be able to mix some phases of a virtual mobility with some phases of physical mobility in the university, talking, taking together 
different universities from Europe, of, of course, coming from different traditions, that is, out of Europe, in Africa, in Asia, or other parts of the world. The blended intensive program is just now at the running way because, for example, in, uh, in Italy and specifically in Pavia, we are discussing how to transform about uh, 10, 15 normal courses with a minimum of three ECTS, European Credit Transfer System, from in-presence traditional course in blended intensive program uh, with uh, at least three universities participating, able to transform an in-presence course in a course to be attended by students from three different universities, partially coming physically and partially partial attending by virtual uh, system. Hmm? So, coming to which will be the specific and, specific and relevant elements of the virtual mobility. Some definition it is very, very important. Virtual mobility has to be intended as an activity of learning, teaching, research, communication, and collaboration. So if you can understand, it is not just a matter of create some resources and put them online, and this is virtual mobility. No, virtual mobility affects how we learn, how we teach, how we do research in learning and teaching, how we communicate with people, with people different from us, and how we will be able to collaborate with them. So you can understand that virtual mobility is just a so rich concept, concept that really can enrich participation and the people who will participate in such kind of experience. And how to develop this, how to implement this, and which are the, um, the relevant elements of this? First, the development of intercultural competence. This is really a main uh, effect of the virtual mobility. This is not only to learn the concept of biology or learn concept of mathematics with students coming from different universities, but first of all, is a matter of develop an intercultural competence because people from different culture can stay together and learn together and share together what they will learn and teach. As a second point, the cooperation of higher education institution. And so you can understand that from the point of view of learning and teaching, putting on the table different universities that co-create and cooperate in order to establish models of virtual mobility can really be a great goal for the higher education of the future. Third, application of appropriate technological solution from learning and teaching. Now, you can understand that also uh, under the pushing of the coronavirus, we had a lot of possibilities, technological possibilities to use these marvelous tools uh, um, to stay together uh, in a synchronous or synchronous mode. It is just a way now in order to be uh, rational and to create models and methodologies and tools to do this. But we have really so powerful tools given us by technology and the enhancement of technology. Four, all of this is aimed at achieving academic goals and recognition. So this is not just fun, okay? This is for fun, <laughs> because for me it's funny, as you can understand, but it is not just this, it is that at the end of this process, we have the academic goal to recognize this experience and achieve learning outcomes. So the idea is that a student will have on his CV uh, exam and path recognized by his home university, but also exam and path recognized by host university in Europe or somewhere. So the idea is to have a concrete result at the end of this process of virtual mobility. 
Finally, we are just um, quite at the end of the presentation. This is a standard roadmap that we will present to the university, uh, into the institution interested to establish model of habitual mobility. First, strategy and management. The idea is that uh, at, at a strategic level and organization level, the university has to be present. Second, to uh, put on the table um, valuable infrastructure, technological infrastructure, in order to build this. Third, how to design the curriculum um, available for this kind of experience. Because as Stefano said, it is not just the same thing to think a curriculum for the presence or to think a curriculum for visual mobility. It is different. So the idea is how to design such kind of curriculum for this experience. We need to another time for, uh, I want to, to be linked with Stefano. We need to uh, organize um, staff training for teacher and academic. We need to support this system. We need to check quality assurance and we need to work with marketing, business, and communication action in order to foster this system. So I am now at my final uh, slide. I, I know that maybe my topic is quite a theoretical topic uh, over the more, maybe more practical um, and maybe more useful <laughs> topic from my colleagues. But the idea to uh, look at internationalization looking about uh, looking uh, and looking it um, through um, the idea that meeting people in a, an organized system of virtual mobility, this process will really enrich the culture of each of us. In the webinar number five, we will discuss about these topics, how to create initiatives of virtual mobility, how to realize it, how to uh, look at them under theoretical aspect, how to foster um, event of intercultural richness, and how to present best practices uh, just happened in the, in the past. So the title of the webinar to be held on 23 September at the same time of the other will be, and each word here as a precise meaning, collaborative, online, trusted relationship. So we are talking about relation between people, teaching, teachers and students and institutions. So collaborative, online, trusted, because there is an agreement, trusted relationship for multicultural exchange. In this webinars, very, very relevant scholar will, will present uh, their uh, idea and above all experience. Irina Volungevicene from Vitauta Smanias University, Lithuania, past president of Eden, a fellow uh, of Eden and now president of uh, Eden uh, Europe. Bim van Petegen, former um, chair of the e-learning task force at the Coimbra Group, uh, executive committee former um, members of the Eden and now a fellow and director of the um, uh, of the uh, review Euro DLL Euro distance learning Francesca Elm past president past chair of the education innovation uh, Coimbra group working group and a member of the University of Padova in Italy Francesca will be focused more on intercultural uh, exchange so uh, I really uh, hope that this uh, uh, topic will interest you and will help you to create a context of internationalization, ICT use for internationalization, and how to foster your richness as people in order to better improve your education together with people coming from all the parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. Uh, very important topic. Definitely, you have very well presented it. So uh, today webinar was actually a teaser for all of you to 
listen to the uh, topics defined in more uh, comprehensive and uh, wider way in, uh, in uh, future webinars. If you have more questions, you can ask them now. Some of the questions which have been asking ha has been already answered uh, uh, in question and answer session or in the chat. Uh, all the presentations uh, will be available at the project website as well as recording and recording will be also available at the Eden uh, website. So definitely uh, you will find it uh, uh, there. Uh, and as this is the project, I'm certain this is the presentations are in open access uh, via Creative Commons license. Uh, uh, so uh, definitely you can use it. If there are any questions, I don't see them uh, now at the moment, but uh, maybe before we close uh, the this uh, today webinar, uh, so the next one is going to be on the May 25th, uh, uh, so please put this uh, into your calendar already. Maybe for the last, uh, uh, I would, uh, okay, I see Jacek has, uh, has uh, raised uh, uh, for the word. Jacek, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, uh, because uh, the next webinar is uh, mine in inverted comma webinar on the 27th of May. Yeah, Seven, and yeah. I would like to ask you to send me some suggestions or questions concerning, uh, you know, this webinar. I uh, put my e email address in the chat. Uh, and uh, your suggestions and questions could be both in English or uh, in uh, Russian. And uh, so I hope on your, uh, you know, reply uh, and uh, some contacts with us. Yes. So I ask all these presenters to focus on specific issues, uh, uh, etc. And perhaps if Sandra uh, doesn't mind, Perhaps you could put in the chat uh, the name of some software you used to uh, facilitate, to foster interactivity. Professor Govoni mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Mentimeter, Kohut, and Answer Garden, as far as I remember. Yes, we know all these uh, three, uh, you know, tools at my university. Perhaps you at your universities use such a tool. So please, uh, simply the name of the tool. It, it also will be more uh, will help us to prepare the next webinar. Uh, th there is a question from uh, Professor Maria Freddi in uh, Italy. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I see this in in uh, in in the uh, chat. Um, mm. Well. Uh, just before I give the word uh, uh, to others, um, I see that there are some, I would say, uh, maybe a little misunderstanding in uh, how these sessions uh, or training uh, uh, will be going on. So uh, maybe, uh, Jean Battista, can you just briefly say uh, these webinars? This this is the education part uh, which is going on, or there will be some. Uh, other possibilities to to pass uh, uh, all these topics we will have uh, the webinars uh, of course organized uh, as a standard for eden uh, in uh, one and a half hour of presentation roughly yeah. one and hour of presentation immediately after and these will be the recorded uh, webinars immediately after and also during the presentation of the webinar via the question and answer section the attendees will be able to interact during the presentation. Immediately after the presentation, we will open the discussion and the discussion will go on. Something like we did today, actually, because today we have the presentation, but we had many questions and answers. Some of them have been already answered. Uh, uh, I don't know now if it's technically possible, but we'll do it uh, in the next webinars to open also to the attendees, not only to the experts, the possibility of uh, uh, speaking directly and presenting directly uh, their opinion and so on and so on. For example, now we have uh, this enormous question posed by Professor Maria Freddi 
uh, how to cascade all these great ideas to the local le level, this is difficult. <laughs> of course, this is all of us, we are academics, and we know that, unfortunately, academia is very much uh, attached to the old ways. We changed a lot. I took part in some lectures in, in some African uh, universities in which there was uh, still the idea of lecture, reading. And uh, if you have someone in front of you starting reading that today, we will discuss <laughs> about this one and this one and what my presentation is. Good morning, bye bye. By after five minutes, all the audience is fully asleep, for sure. I guess that uh, a theoretical presentation, it is important, but this is not the way. The way is to involve ourselves first and colleagues into one experience like that of today. Today, I, I cannot say I go back home because I'm at home, but I come back to my experience as a teacher, asking myself how tomorrow may I change my way of teaching? How can I invite one colleague or some colleagues to share this experience? And I guess this is the way by which sharing experience directly, because it's not possible to explain how to do something. I'm very, very fond of going mountaineering. I can speak with you, present you some pictures, etc. But the only way will be to invite you to come with me to walk together into my mountains. And therefore, either you'll kill me at the end of the walk or you'll start doing what's going on. But uh, I think that uh, Professor Govoni is our expert on this field. Please, Stefano. Yes, uh, yes. yes uh, uh, what uh, I wanted to say to Professor Maria Freddi uh, is that uh, uh, actually uh, in Pavia, we are uh, doing something. Uh, we founded uh, the MIDA group, which is a faculty development program that started uh, uh, beginning this year and back uh, when I still was the uh, delegate for uh, teaching activity. But the, the question is very important how to realize whatever is presented in your own university. Uh, I think that we are bringing in our uh, webinars uh, uh, some direct experience and we are creating a network of people that uh, can be reached uh, uh, to which ask, how did you do in your university? Can you help me? And Elena, when she uh, ended the presentation, uh, just said, I will help you too. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I'm speaking for myself, but everybody in this panel will do the same. I will help you. That can be our <laughs> message to all the listeners. So write to us. In my presentation, I put my mail and I think that you can have the mail of all the presenters. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, just to give me a second. So definitely you can find more information on the project where, website uh, where you can find the emails and contacts. Uh, definitely uh, the issue of collaboration and networking is something we have to cherish because this enables us uh, to get the information from the others, to take what's the best from the others and adapt to our needs. So definitely no, there's no solution one size fits all, but solutions which can be something which will enable you to provide your own uh, uh, experience and, and own solution. Jacek, your final words, and then we are concluding. Just uh, the microphone. on the mic. I would like to add what uh, to add something to what Professor uh, Gavoni said. It's really extremely difficult to translate general idea into 
practice, you know, concrete uh, classes uh, uh, at the level of a department. But uh, actually, uh, one of the methods is to show a case study or good practice, yes? And, uh, you know, I think that uh, perhaps you agree with me that the idea of the webinars uh, is not to be mentor, you know, saying something ex cathedra, but to show some experience we actually uh, have at Pavia University, at uh, the Jagiellonian University, at, at Eden, and uh, say, Dear participants, uh, uh, perhaps it is interesting for you. Perhaps this could e inspire you. Yeah, and this is, uh, you know, the, the attempt to translate general idea into, uh, you know, practice. Yes, uh, Sandra, perhaps that's the best way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alcek. You have summarized very well uh, uh, what was what is the aim. Uh, so uh, now we have come to 19 minutes of the webinar the, to finish the session. I invite you all to join us in a two-week time uh, on May 27th. As Jacek said, uh, please, if you have any ideas uh, for this topic, uh, which will be uh, on uh, so med medical faculties and digital education, send him uh, emails with your questions so they can present uh, better. Uh, the ideas uh, and the experience that they have. So thank you all of you for being with us today. I wish to thank all the speakers and to presenters. Uh, so see you in uh, two weeks time at 11 uh, a.m. Central Eastern time. Thank you again, bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to everybody. We started a beautiful adventure. Let's yeah. go on with yeah. that. It is true. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste, and thank you to all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to all.